Section 1 First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 5. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 5. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the last lecture in the series on food science, which, as you already know, is about the avocado. Let's start with a little history. On May 15th, 1915, in the posh new Hotel Alexandria in Los Angeles, a cadre of California farmers gathered to decide the fate of a new crop. The aguacate, a pebbly-skinned, pear-shaped fruit, had been the staple food in Mexico and Central and South America since 500 BC. In the 16th century, Spanish conquistadors fell in love with the fruit after observing its prized status among the Aztecs. Until the early 1900s, the aguacate had never been grown commercially in the United States. By 1914, however, hotels in Los Angeles and San Francisco were ordering as many of the fruits as they could and paying as much as $12 for a dozen. But the farmers faced a marketing problem. First, aguacate was too hard for Americans to pronounce. It also had another unappealing name, alligator pear. The farmers came up with a new name, avocado. They informed dictionary publishers of the change and named their own group the California Avocado Association. The approach worked. Today, California accounts for nearly 90% of all avocados grown in the United States. When the farmers first met, E.J. Wilson, a Berkeley horticulturalist, predicted little interest from the American market, saying that it contained no sugar and fruits were supposed to be sweet. The sweeter, the better. The farmers knew that Wilson's concerns were unfounded. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 6 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 6 to 10. What made the avocado so different from other fruits was the very reason it was appealing. Like most fruit, the avocado ripens once plucked from the tree, but its flesh is unlike any other, buttery, not sweet, somewhat nutty and oily in flavour. Firm enough to be sliced or diced, yet pliable enough to be mashed into paste or puree. There are more than 400 varieties of avocado, but Haas has become the most popular in the United States. Named after a postal worker, Rudolf Haas, who purchased the seedling in 1926 from a California farmer, the distinctive purplish black fruit has a thicker skin and smaller body than the other varieties. Farmers found the Haas easier to cultivate and its higher oil content and good nutty flavour appealed to customers. Avocados present a mouth-watering array of serving options. They can be sliced and served with apples, nuts and cheese. In their most popular form, guacamole, they are mashed with salt, lime, garlic, coriander, chilies, and tomatoes, depending on the recipe. They can be fed to infants, and Indonesians blend them into drinks with sweet condensed milk. Brazilians add it to ice cream. Californians put it in their maki rolls. Avocados have a subtle nutty flavour, too subtle for some people to get excited about, but the beauty of avocados is not so much its flavour but its oily consistency. Avocados have become popular in restaurants and homes because, in food science terms, 
they act as a covalent bond with other ingredients. The creaminess of the fruit converts disparate tastes into complementary ones and adds flavor to otherwise dull ingredients. Another way to think of avocado's role is to consider the fat marbling in a prime steak. Marbling is what makes a steak flavorful. Avocados, with their natural fatty richness, serve a similar purpose when incorporated with other foods. Mash an avocado with a pinch of salt and a drizzle of oil, and you'll find it adds flavor to. That is the end of section one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section two. Section two. First, you have some time to look at questions eleven to fourteen. Now listen carefully and answer questions eleven to fourteen. Good afternoon, and welcome to today's lecture on red squirrel conservation in the UK. The red squirrel is the UK's only native squirrel species, and was once a common sight across the UK, but for decades they've been in decline. Today, red squirrels are sadly absent from most of the UK, affected by the spread of the introduced non-native grey squirrel. Red squirrels live in coniferous forests and deciduous woods in Europe and northern Asia. Their range extends from the UK, Ireland, and Western Europe to Russia, Mongolia, and northwest China. Numbers in the UK have fallen dramatically since red squirrels were introduced as an ornamental species in the 1870s. Since then, the UK population of reds has dropped from around 3.5 million to between 120,000 to 160,000 individuals, according to different estimates. The population in England is thought to be as low as 15,000. Population strongholds are Scotland, Northumberland, Wales, Northern Ireland, and the Lake District, as well as on islands such as Brown Sea. By the way. If you want to see them in the wild, prime spotting times are morning and late afternoon because that's when they're most active. Before you hear the rest of the podcast, you have some time to look at questions fifteen to twenty. Now listen, and answer questions fifteen to twenty. The red squirrel is officially classed as near threatened in England, Wales, and Northern Ireland, but is locally common in Scotland. The main cause behind their decline, as I mentioned previously, is the introduction of grey squirrels from America. There are three main reasons why greys are a threat. Firstly, grey squirrels carry a disease, squirrel parapox virus, which does not appear to affect their health, but often kills red squirrels. Also, grey squirrels are more likely to eat green acorns, so will decimate the food sources before reds get to them. Reds can't digest mature acorns, so they can only eat green acorns. And when red squirrels are put under pressure, they will not breed as often. 
Another huge factor in their decline is the loss of woodland over the last century, but road traffic and predators are also threats too. Red squirrels are recognizable by their red to russet fur, ear tufts, and long fluffy tails, but the color of their coats can vary, with some reds appearing very gray, and some gray squirrels can have red fur down their backs and on their feet. Reds have small ear tufts that can develop into large tufts in the winter. Red squirrels are very elusive and spend much of their time in a tree canopy. Ways to spot them include looking out for large drays in trees, scratch marks on bark, and chewed pine cones that look like chewed apple cores. It is also helpful to listen for their chuck chuck noise, which is a vocalization they often use. Red squirrels have a mainly vegetarian diet that includes seeds, hazelnuts, and green acorns, fungus, bark, and sapwood. They also occasionally take animal prey, such as young birds and eggs. They especially favor pine seeds, but also eat larch and spruce seeds. Because they disperse seeds, they play a vital role in the reforestation process. Reds do not hibernate and store fungi in trees to eat over the winter months. When food is plentiful, they put on weight in the autumn to help them through the winter. This is important for breeding females, so that they are in good condition for producing young in the spring. Red squirrels usually produce two to three young, called kittens, in February to April, and they often produce a second litter from May to June. Outside of the mating season, red squirrels tend to live alone, but in early spring, watch out for their courtship displays in the trees. Babies are born 45 to 48 days after mating, and are looked after by their mothers. Kittens are weaned around 10 weeks when they develop a complete set of teeth. Some stay with their mothers over winter. Between 20 and 50% of red squirrel kittens survive to adulthood. There are projects across Britain to develop long-term conservation strategies that deter greys and encourage reds. That is the end of section 2. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section 3. Section 3. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. Right, Anna. I believe it's your turn to provide the research for the seminar today. You've been researching how marketing technology is changing how marketers use social media. Is that correct? That's right, yes. And what have you found out about how technology is being used in marketing? Well, with the first wave of this technology, Marketers wanted to see how they were performing, how to trend on social media, and then make decisions based on that. Right. And has that changed? Yes. Now it's much more complex. Marketers are managing multiple brands. There are many social networks to manage, and there is a lot of content to generate each day. The work marketers have to do on social media is huge. The technology is becoming more about using the data that really matters to play around with audiences, optimise content, see how people engage, and of course, optimise spending. 
When marketers have access to powerful data from social networks, in what smart, creative ways are they using that data to optimize in the areas you just mentioned? When you have data about an audience that engages with a brand, smart marketers want to know more about who those people are. For example, are there different personalities that prefer different product lines? They also want to know how personalities evolve over time to help them make decisions. Right. Before you hear the rest of the discussion, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 26 to 30. And the other area is content. What types of content are the most engaging and what actually influences the audience? If you're creating a campaign for a brand or product, it's important to know who you're speaking to, which users will be most engaged, and the users who will drive the success of this campaign. In the past, this was done by guesswork or agency studies, but today it's almost happening in real time. Marketers can have a view of their audience almost immediately that allows them to make quick, smart decisions. Marketers are constantly searching for technologies that help them prove they're making the right decisions. Can you give an example of this? Sure. One big trend on social media is that the cost of paid content is rising so marketers are adding tools that allow them to gauge how an advertisement has performed in terms of cost, reach, and audience engagement against total spend. Marketers want to know not only how they performed, but also whether they paid more or less than their competitors. Speaking of costs, what performance benchmarks are marketers using now for paid social, and will those change in the coming years? Marketers' first big focus at the moment is engagement. They see how content performs and what is gaining popularity. They also want to know whether their audience is going to their competitors or whether new brands are starting to win new customers. Great. Thanks for that, Anna. Now, let's move on. That is the end of Section 3. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section 4. Section 4. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Hello everyone. Welcome to this morning's lecture on the subject of the reintroduction of wolves to Yellowstone Park. This is one in a series of lectures organised for the university by the Environmental Society. My name's Brenda Johnston and I am an environmental scientist with a particular interest in this initiative to regenerate Yellowstone Park. 
One of the most exciting scientific findings of the past half century has been the discovery of trophic cascades. A trophic cascade is an ecological process that starts with an animal at the top of the food chain and makes an impact on creatures at the bottom of the chain. A classic example is what happened in the Yellowstone National Park in the United States when wolves were reintroduced in 1995. Now, we all know that wolves kill various species of animals, but perhaps we're not aware that they also give life to many others. Before the wolves were reintroduced, they'd been absent for 70 years. The numbers of deer had increased in the Yellowstone Park because there had been no bigger animals to hunt them. Those deer had reduced the vegetation there to almost nothing. They had just grazed it away, eaten it. But as soon as the wolves arrived, things started to change. First, of course, the wolves killed some of the deer, but that wasn't the major thing. Much more importantly, they changed the behaviour of the deer. The deer started avoiding certain parts of the park, the places where they could be trapped most easily by the wolves, and immediately those places started to regenerate. In some areas, the height of the trees increased by five times in just six years. And as soon as that happened, the birds started moving in. The number of songbirds started to increase greatly. The number of beavers also started to increase because beavers like to eat the trees. And the beavers built dams in the rivers that provided habitats for ducks, fish and reptiles. But here's where it gets really interesting. The wolves also changed the behaviour of the rivers because there were now trees and plants with strong roots holding the soil together that prevented soil erosion. The river narrowed. More pools formed. This was important for wildlife habitats. The rivers changed in response to the wolves. So the wolves, small in number, transformed not just the ecosystem of the Yellowstone National Park, but also its physical... That is the end of section four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.